Hello students, Michael Sanchez here. Thank you so much for watching today's class. Uh, so far we've done three classes, uh, kind of at different ability levels of the violin. Uh, we just did a vibrato video, and uh, this next video is going to be on double stops and also uh, spiccato. So for those of you guys that don't know what that is, spiccato is basically off the string um, bouncing of the bow, and double stops is when you hit two strings at once. So we're going to basically give you guys some tips today. Uh, my name is Michael Sanchez. I've been teaching uh, full-time about six years, and we also have with us today Mary Moser. Um, she's an instructor that's going to help us out and give and contribute to the today's class. How are you doing today, Mary? Let me unmute you real quick. There you go. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And that's your son in the background? Yes. <laughs> Good to see you. And we also have with us Stephen McMullen, um, teacher from Houston, Texas. How are you doing today, Stephen? I'm fine. Thank you. So basically, uh, I'll get us started. Um, we'll first kind of talk about double stops uh, and, give, and give students some tips. Um, basically, what I find with students that first start learning double stops is that they tend to really tense up, and it causes uh, um, inconsistent sound, um, um, just about any type of bad sound you can think of when there's tension. Um, so just like when you play on the G, D, A, or E, you know, you move your bow smoothly, you don't grab the bow too tight, you have good technique in your wrist, everything that it takes to get a good sound on the violin does not change the double stops. It's very easy to think that you need more force to like grab the strings more because you're dealing with two instead of one. That's incorrect. Um, it's all about contact. So just like you're getting good contact in one string at a time, there's no difference, only that it's in between the strings for A and D, like that. So that's definitely a misconception, and uh, most students that um, first start learning double stops, they, they think it needs way more force than it, than it really needs. So that's definitely uh, something to keep in mind. What I recommend that you guys do um, is start off with just open strings and trying to hit, um, start with like G and D, try to hit them as clean as possible right off the bat. Um, what's going to be easy when you're first starting double stops is leaning more on one string more than the other, especially at first. So try to get that solid, consistent sound of hitting both at the same time. Now notice the speed of my bow. I'm not going too fast. I'm not going too slow. I'm just going nice and consistent. It's hard to do that at first. Um, you might be gripping the bow too hard. You might be changing your technique to do the double stops. That's pretty common. So maybe do four of those, then try four of the DNA. And then try A and E as well. So just try to get that nice and clean sound. And that's the best way to at least start. Uh, let's get uh, Mary's take kind of on starting double stops. Um, what's your take on getting, you know, the best clean sound possible and uh, some of the things that you advise to your students? Um, exactly what you mentioned, Michael. Um, I do a discussion of having a balance between the two strings. So we balance our bow, let's say, on the A, and then we need to move our bow from the A string. If here's the A there, and then we have the D, we need to lift in order to be able to touch so that we're at 50% on the A, 50% on the D, and then we gently pull, uh, always having the word gentle, because already we'll be louder uh, because we'll be playing two strings instead of one. So the, the idea that a double stop makes you louder is true because you're playing two strings at the same time, but it doesn't mean that we need to be heavier about it. Most of the time we want to press because we're not catching the other string and so we're trying to grab onto it. If we push hard enough, we will hit the other string. But in reality, if we balance our bow and we're gentle about it and we try to sustain, sort of like walking on a tightrope, because you want to retain that balance as you go to the tip and as you return back to the frog. And you're going to have a little bit of a waver, but over time that balance in your arm will be much more comfortable. Then intonation becomes a different issue. It is great to start with open strings first to get accustomed to hearing two strings at the same time, and hopefully they're in tune, because then as we add another um, 
the other element of adding a finger, then we have to listen in a very different way. I love, somebody had mentioned Whistler, Harvey Whistler, and he has a developing double stop book. That is amazing. I love that. Talk about going from zero to being very proficient on double stops. Um, and he likes to do, which then is what I do with all of my students, is a broken, going separate, finding the balance, and then playing together. And, um, and always listening to the separate notes. We want to attack the two strings at the same time so eagerly that we forget that the two pitches need to work together. So um, doing a separate, separate together gives us that um, routine of how we go about in dealing with double stops and breaking them and then bringing them apart, breaking them and then bringing them apart until we're proficient, comfortable enough to go through that phase a little faster to the point where it will sound as if we're never breaking them apart. Thank you, Mary. Very good insights. Um, Stephen, what is your take on the, the whole double stops kind of starting out concept? <clears throat> yeah, uh, all very good information. Start with the bow. Make sure that you're able to, to uh, maintain contact with two strings. It's, it's actually kind of a delicate operation, too. Let me just illustrate. If you play on a single string, do you see how much I've been able to wobble the bow? And I have yet to run into another string. So the amount of, um, uh, of accuracy in order to maintain the bow on two strings if I, if I deviate in the slightest, uh, one way or the other, I lose the tone of one of the strings. And so the amount of, of control in the position of the arm as we go through the trajectory of the bow stroke, um, it's a very delicate thing. And so um, <clears throat> it, since, since human beings are not built in straight lines, since we're all curly, um, we have to make certain little adjustments as we go along through the bow stroke in order to get the bow to maintain. Our brain tells us, I, I want to keep the bow moving straight. And so we, we do these things that we think feel straight to us, um, but they throw the bow off course. And so it, it's only the contact uh, between the hair and the strings that maintains the tone of both strings. Um, so you, you're going to have to get used to experiencing these, these little adjustments in the position of your whole arm so that a clean bow stroke remains against both of those strings. Um, let's see, something else came to mind. That's, that's the right-handed part of it. I love what Mary said about um, realizing that, that two tones are stronger than one. So being relaxed with the tone is, uh, I think, a very good start uh, to double stops. Um, we, tend, we tend to sometimes be freaked out by what we see on the page, and it makes us exert all kinds of effort uh, because it, it looks terrifying to the eyes, but um, once you simplify it and in, in translate it into physical movements, um, it's a little easier to relax. Oh. I remembered what I was going to say. Uh, when students are having, when my students are having a particularly difficult time um, keeping the bow on both strings, and inevitably they all try to look down at the bow, and from this angle where we're where we're looking at the strings in the bow, it's almost like an optical illusion. You you cannot tell by looking whether the bow is actually touching one string or two sometimes. And so I tell them to close their eyes and practice this bow stroke, just completely relying on their ears because the ears tell them instantly that one of the tones has disappeared. And if they don't know which one, um, I just tell them to experiment. Rock your arm, pivot from the shoulder, and rock your arm gently until you find both tones again. And I think the blindfold method works pretty good. 
Great insights. Thank you, Stephen. So yeah, that's basically the um, the right hand kind of starting off. Um, but for some of you guys, maybe you've done double stops for a while now. And technically, a double stop is when you're actually putting multiple fingers down. Um, I learned that recently, um, the technicality of it. Um, a drone is when you're just putting one finger down and you have an open string along with it. That's kind of a fiddle type term as well. But um, you know, a lot of students struggle with the actual finger placement regarding double stops. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that. So what's so important when you're doing double stops is that you're staying away from the string that you're also playing with your finger. So what happens so often is that students, let's say I have a first finger on the D string that's supposed to be played with an open A. So many students just place their finger down on the D string, not thinking about you know, what they're touching as far as the A string, but even just a little bit of a nick of your finger hitting the A string causes an absolutely terrible sound. Raspy, horrible, I'm sure you've heard it before, cat noise. <laughs> so what you have to do is you have to have your finger not right on top of the string like you normally would play just a, a string by itself. You have to have it more towards the other string. It's okay to have your finger touching, totally touching the G string and the D string as long as you're staying away from the A string. So what you can do to test this is place your finger down like you're gonna do the double stop. Um, in this case, like I said, I'm doing D1 open A and just pluck the A string. And if you're getting that sound, that clean open string sound, then you're not hitting the other string. But now if I'm getting this sound, my finger is just barely nicking the A string, which is gonna cause again a horrible sound. And it's just even a little bit causes that. So let's say I'm playing um, a first finger on the D string and a third finger on the G string, C sharp. This is a harder one. It's really easy for this finger to hit the D string just slightly. So what you have to do is you have to just lean more towards, you know, off the instrument like this so that the D, you're actually getting an E in there and not um, the three touching the E like this. Now if my three was hitting the D string, with that sound. So uh, that's definitely something to, to watch out for. Um, Mary, what's your insight on the on left hand reg regarding double stops? I agree. Uh, we call that uh, tunneling when we want to have that inside string free and setting our fingers so that there's a tunnel under it so that you can hear that in there, which means that sometimes you can tuck your elbow a little bit more under. Man, I'm gonna get this set up right. <laughs> you gotta tuck your elbow a little bit more under. This is exaggerated, but um, under in order to rotate the fingers on onto the string closer to the lower string and letting that A ring as you were um, mentioning. Uh, and so, I also talk about placing your fingers on the thumb side. So when when you kind of touch your fingers, there's a corner, or if you look at it this way, this is the thumb side, this is the thumb side, thumb side, thumb side, and the opposite could be the pinky side. And if you're on the thumb side, that helps, your, your thumb will run across all of those little edges, which is only one side. And if you're angled in that way and you kind of tuck your elbow a little bit more, that helps in order to create those clearances, whether it's a 1-2, a 1-3, or a 1-4, or any combination whatsoever. Um, and in it, it's very important then to also stay relaxed. Because again, as we will tense up with a bow because we want to make something happen, we'll also tense up in the left hand and start squeezing which then brings all the fingers closer together, which again is counterproductive and does the exact opposite of what we want to do. So instead of opening the hand, then everything is running into each other. Excellent, excellent insight. Thank you, Mary. Um, Stephen, your thoughts on left hand regarding double stops? Uh, uh, just, uh, one second, I'll uh, put the mute. There you go. Go ahead, Stephen.
Yeah, it's kind of ironic that after we build a foundation and a, a good hand position, after we ask all of our students to center their fingers um, on the string, then in double stopping, we ask them to play off the centers of the fingers in order to leave clearance for the other strings. <clears throat> I like the tunneling concept. Uh, a lot of teachers uh, are able to explain what's going on with that. So there's there's always um, a good arch to the fingers, which allows the tunneling to take place. Um, good double stopping too. It really requires and it reinforces hand position because anything, any of the rules that we're using for hand position for single note playing are even more important in double stop playing. The tipping the elbow underneath to give uh, mechanically, when we, when we make this motion underneath the neck, you can see that it carries the fingers directly across the strings and it maintains the, the platform that, that our technique is, is coming from. So the machinery uh, remains consistent all the way across the strings. If we, if we curl the fingers to play on high strings and then extend the fingers to play on low strings, we get this diagonal effect which drives our, our intonation <clears throat> off course from one side of the fingerboard to the other. So the, 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 the more you activate this little bit of freedom underneath the neck with the arm, uh, the more you can assume a good hand position in your double stopping too. Great, thank you, Stephen. So yeah, that's kind of uh, some insights regarding double stopping. Uh, feel free to email me uh, at rivertownviolin at hotmail.com if you have any questions about double stopping. Uh, it certainly takes practice and uh, it's a, um, not something that you definitely learn in one day. So it takes time to, to develop good technique in the, in the left and the right hands. Uh, we still have a few minutes. Um, I'd like to maybe not spend uh, too much time uh, as we're running out of time on the spiccato. But I did want to talk about it and um, give you guys some, some tips and drills on that. Um, so basically, again, spiccato is basically when you actually get the bow elevated off the strings, it bounce, um, get a bounce off the strings. So spiccato is when you have on the string, your, your bow is actually staying on the string like this. Spiccato is when you're actually getting the elevated off the string. Like that. Um, what I find students um, have the biggest trouble when it comes to this, again, is tension, um, is trying to force the spiccato too much, telling the bow what to do. So basically, I'll exaggerate a little bit. It's kind of like you're doing this. You're not letting the bow do the work. Um, having a good quality bow really helps a lot with spiccato because the flexibility of, of a wood stick really can um, bounce a certain way to where it's uh, a lot cleaner. Um, compared to like, for example, if you had a fiberglass bow or something that's cheap, um, you're going to have a really hard time doing spiccato because it really is all about setting the bow up to do the work for you. Um, one thing that you guys can try to do if you actually want to do this, if you have your bow around, take your finger and try to find the balance point um, of your bow. So actually try to balance it on your finger. So every bow is just a little bit different based on the weight distribution. But this spot that I'm trying to find is the bounciest part of the bow. So this is where you really can get the best spiccato. And it's gonna vary on every bow. But so right about here is where I kind of found that bouncy balance point, the middle. That's a good place to, to work on the spiccato. Now to get that consistent clean sound that I'm getting. It's all about, again, not changing anything with your bow hand. Um, most students, what they do, like I said, they force it. They don't let the bow do the work. Their wrist is maybe locked up. It's really stiff. Um, you know, anything really can happen. Your shoulder might be pressing. You're gripping too hard. Something can easily um, change, uh, you know, the way that you're holding the bow. It's going to affect your spiccato. So you really have to set yourself up to where you're guiding the bow in the front and you're just letting the bow do the work. So that's kind of my insight on it, and um, definitely takes practice. Uh, let's hear from Mary um, some of her insights on um, working on spiccato for the first time. 
Um, I also include <laughs> of um, relaxing the wrist and relaxing the fingers so that you know, I, I think there's a fine art with the instrument of once you put the violin on and the bow on, that there's a bit of balance um, in holding the instrument, holding the bow, and trying to find magical spots. So it's really an adventure. It's a mystery in a way. And um, you have to be willing to spend time to find out where these things are. So when dealing with is also being careful not to go too fast, wanting it to be lightning or um, you know having having it be at performance tempo when really the motion needs to be sort of slow and comfortable. Does I think we all realize it's in the lower half. If it, the instrument was cut in half, it's approximately half of that half, so in a, in a quarter, and being able to do a little tiny stroke and let it come off and then taking it back up and getting that sound in a slow motion so that you're comfortable finding out how much is little before wanting to add speed <laughs> so um, then trying to do two of them in a row a down and an up Having the dropping of the bow, it's not really a drop, but a gentle uh, brush. Um, trying to find that and, and uh, thinking, you know, for whatever reason, some of our terms are not very technically minded. Uh, we can call that a spiccato, but we can also call it a quick brush stroke. And we think of, you know, a big paintbrush going up and down and up and down. We want the hair of the bow to be simulating that motion. And it's very small and it's very gentle. So you've got to make sure that your shoulders and your arms are relaxed instead of trying to make it happen. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Stephen, um, your take on spiccato. Yeah, it's, um, you know, there are, there are various shades of this particular thing. And I think the one that that terrifies people perhaps the most is the, the more automatic one where we give over the control of the bouncing to the stick itself. Um, where the bow is jumping um, because of the springiness of the, of the, the hair and the stick. Um, when we, when we do, uh, um, the other term for this is off the string. So, um, uh, when a, when a conductor or in an orchestra, when we use this language, we're either playing off the string or on the string. So this off the string playing that we do at a slower speed in a lower portion of the bow, um, depends on all of the elements being in place, a flexibility in the fingers, uh, a relaxed nature in the arm, and the the trajectory of the bow. Um, if it's too if it's too V shaped, then we get that scratchy little pecky sound. Um, so we have to we have to flatten out the trajectory a little bit so that it's more bowl shaped, so that the hair stays in contact with the string long enough to give us uh, a pleasant tone. Um, as, as we move to the faster spiccato, it's a, it's a little higher usually in the balance point of most people's bows um, and takes place at a more rapid speed. And some would even say that the hair doesn't really leave the string. The hair is relatively remains in contact with the string, and it's it's the bow that's that's actually doing this little bit of springing. So the the quality of the bow, like you said, is extremely important. Um, and I tell you, really expensive bows. If you ever if you play if you ever play on one, you'll never forget it. It's like driving a Lamborghini. <laughs> Nothing will ever feel the same again after that. Um, and 
And what happens is these, these beautiful bows that function this way, uh, just like modern tennis rackets. You remember in the old days when tennis rackets were smaller um, and you had to aim for the sweet spot and there wasn't much of that? Um, now they've enlarged the racket and they've engineered the, uh, the tension on the, the racket so that the sweet spot has been enlarged greatly. And I find the same principle with, with really fine bows is that the, it seems like the, the sweet spot where it will do anything you want it to do is quite a bit larger on a, on a really fine bow than it is um, on a less expensive one. Excellent. I, <laughs> I really liked your Lamborghini uh, analogy there. That was great. <laughs> yeah, they look like they're going 100 miles an hour when they're parked. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you, um, Stephen and Mary, so much for your participation in these classes. We, we certainly hope to see you again. And um, uh, this is a, just an excellent class. I'm excited to post this on YouTube for, for anybody out there that wasn't able to join today live. Um, we have some great insights, and I'm excited for these classes going forward. I hope to see a lot of you guys again um, in the future. So please email me if you have any questions, if you're confused about anything regarding the classes, uh, rivertownviolin at hotmail.com. And for now, we're going to say goodbye to all you YouTube um, customers out there, fans, everybody. Um, if everybody wants to wave goodbye, everybody out there watching on video. Um, and uh, the perk about staying, actually being live in the class, um, anybody that's here can ask questions to the teachers um, individually. So um, we're going to do that right now. And uh, thank you all for watching from YouTube.